the full gamut of the current F1 calendar has circuits that require very different approaches. Stretching from the flat-out straights of Monza where speed is king, to the winding streets of Monte Carlo where downforce-laden cars reign, F1 teams must set up their cars to each and every one. In an ideal world, teams want to design cars that produce as much downforce as possible to boost speed through the corners, but without creating too much aerodynamic drag. After all the clues in the name, drag pegs back the car's speed and acceleration and potentially leaves the driver vulnerable on the straights. It's all a very fine balancing act for the more multi-purpose circuits with lots of different corner profiles, and leaves teams having to work out which parts of the circuit yield the most lap time. But which circuits require power, and which ones require more downforce? Let's take a look at the different setups involved. Firstly, what is a high downforce track in Formula 1? This is when most of a car's performance over the course of a lap can be attributed to the aerodynamic downforce it produces, rather than the power of its engine. High downforce tracks will have fewer and shorter straights than low downforce tracks, with more of an emphasis on corners. Circuits like Monaco and Hungary are usually cited as the key high downforce circuits, where rear wings of the size of barn doors and the full collection of downforce generating parts are tacked onto the car. Let's compare that to the demands of a power circuit. A power track is more or less the opposite. Most of a car's performance is tied to, funnily enough, the power, acceleration and top speed made possible by the engine. Long straights and short, slow corners are typical features of power tracks. Monza is usually the benchmark of a power track, but there's also circuits like Spa and Baku, which require a little less downforce to make up time on the straights. But this of course has an effect on driving style. More downforce creates more grip in corners, which allows drivers to carry more speed and hit the throttle earlier on the exit. The flip side of this is that more aggressive cornering tends to wear out the tyres more quickly, so smoother steering wheel inputs might be needed in order to make the rubber last longer. With reduced downforce, the drivers often have to pump the brakes earlier, as the contact between the tyre and the road is reduced and yields less grip overall. There's no official guide to what constitutes a high downforce track, but the team's approach to each circuit shows where they think downforce is a priority and where they think power is important. Monaco and Hungary, again, are examples of high downforce tracks, with Imola, Singapore and Spain also factoring, with their relatively short straights and lots of turns putting an emphasis on cornering speed. In particular, Sector 3 at Barcelona, which features a series of low-speed turns, is historically a good indicator for how cars will perform in Monaco, which normally follows Spain on the F1 calendar. Tracks like Silverstone and Spa feature high-speed sequences that can see the drivers pulling up to 6G in some cases. These are often a balance between downforce and power owing to their long straights, and so these two tracks are often grouped together by engineers with regards to the design of their car. Yet again, the Italian Grand Prix at Monza is the closest you'll get to a true power track in F1. Drivers are believed to spend 75% of the lap at full throttle around Monza, and the fastest laps ever recorded in the history of Formula 1 are typically set here. Lewis Hamilton holds the record for the highest average speed recorded over a single lap, averaging 164.267 miles per hour, that's 254.362 kilometers an hour, on his way to pole position at Monza in 2020. Monza usually gets its own bespoke aero package, and teams tend to run extremely low-profile rear wings that significantly reduce drag compared to a normal setup. Allowances also have to be made for the extra strain placed on the engine for the duration of the race, and the number of times the cars need to brake from full speed. Although the Mexican Grand Prix at the Autodromo Hermanos Rodriguez has long straights and low to medium speed corners that should make it a pure power track, teams usually run full downforce setups here. This is because the circuit is located 2,285 metres above sea level, and so the air is so thin that teams can afford to run as much downforce as they like on their cars without developing excessive levels of drag. In the 1980s, when there was often a mix between normally aspirated and turbo engines, the turbo-powered cars would run riot, as the thinner air was compressed to deliver more power. Today's current F1 cars push up to 1,000 brake horsepower in racing trim, so surely they can push through the drag? But in fact, the two are mathematically linked. And yes, it's science time again. Here's the simple drag force equation. Drag force equals a half times density rho, times drag coefficient cd, times frontal area a, times velocity squared. Now power is force times velocity. So by relating the two, this changes the equation to power equals a half times rho times cd times a times v cubed, and shows the escalating need for power to overcome the increased drag as the velocity now cubes. 
By reducing the other values, such as the coefficient of drag and frontal area, you reduce the power needed to overcome that drag, hence why Monza and other high-speed circuits use those smaller wings. When balancing the need for downforce against the need for power, such as at circuits like Spa and Silverstone, teams will often use spoon-shaped rear wings, where the central section is of a greater camber, in other words the total wing curvature from the front to the back, compared to the outer parts. This is to reduce the drag, but also to retain the central working area that produces the majority of downforce. Aside from the varying sizes of rear wings, higher downforce circuits often require more setup considerations with regards to suspension depending on the grip required in the corners. That trade-off is having suspension soft enough to ride the curbs for optimum grip, but stiff enough to still deliver grip across the rest of the circuit. This is done by changing torsion bars and springs to deliver a different spring rate to improve the compliance over bumps. Currently in F1, there's lots of different circuits for F1 engineers to get their teeth into, each with their own characteristics and requirements to succeed at. But once the car is designed and developed back in the factory, it's up to the race team at the track to get the most out of it. Yeah.